My name is Don Vivret. Welcome to Financial and State Literacy. This is It's Your Money, spring of 2022, since early on I had called it 2020. Um, week six, financial planning two. What I want to do is touch a little bit on a couple of things before we begin, or as we begin, rather. Uh, there is a workbook that has been created. It is on the website. I will show you that in a minute. You can go through and use it if you wish to, to make notes on where we have been since we're doing the last session at this point. And what I want to do at the moment is I'm going to switch over to the website, which should be this guy. Yes, we'll use that one. So I came into the website, which is on the link that you have on the weekly updates that you get. And if I click on It's Your Money, it's always fun when you do these live to see how fast it will respond or not respond. Anyway, came up very quickly. Um, these are the various weeks. Obviously, we're in week six at this point. So here is the presentation that Laura is going to give. Her Ask First form is also there. Um, what occurs after about a week or so is this is the video, for instance, for last week. So each of the, the recordings that we have done are on the website. We'll probably be there, I'm guessing, for about six months at least until we hit the spring and we do these again. So at this point, what I'm going to do is stop sharing my screen and I'm going to say to Pete, what would you like to talk about now, Pete? A little bit about the financial and the state literacy. Um, uh, Laura, why don't you come on screen and uh, we're going to hello. Morning. Good morning. Um, Financial and state literacy is all about trying to educate you uh, about money, estate planning, and that giving is good for you, not only mentally, uh, uh, but also sometimes even financially. So, um, and Laura, I'm proud to say, was one of our earliest uh, uh, members of our board, and, and so is Don. So, uh, we're here to try to educate you and uh, about money. And Laura is, uh, how many years have you been in the practice of the, of the financial services industry? And before Laura answers that question, what I'm going to do is I'm going to monitor the question and answers. So I'm going to disappear for a while. And occasionally I will come back and ask questions as we go, commentary, whatever, and answer questions along the way and have a good one. Thank okay. you. Wanna, Thank you, Doug. Want to answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 40, 40 years. 40 years, and um, uh, you have uh, uh, credentials, and what's your credentials? Uh, I'm a certified financial planner. And what kind of practice do you hold, that you run? Talk, uh, talk a little bit about your practice. Yeah, so um, I would call our, our firm a multifamily office. We do uh, a lot of different things for client, a small number of families. We have about 112 families, and we do financial planning, investment management. Uh, for some clients, we do tax preparation, bill pay, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, approximately how much do you have under management? You know, this is a, that's a great question because I'm not looking at that just like everybody shouldn't be looking at their accounts every day right now. <laughs> yeah. um, a billion-ish. <laughs> uh, a billion. Approximately a billion. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and how do you... Uh, uh, and you are what they call a fiduciary. Yes. And uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, to it, to us, it means that we are fee only. We don't sell any products. We always um, uh, work in the best interests of our clients, as we're required to do as a fiduciary. And uh, talk a little bit about how you charge. So um, typically, we charge a percentage of the assets that we manage. Um, you know, 0.3% to 1%, depending on uh, complexity of the situation and asset size. Sometimes we charge flat fees, um, once in a while, uh, hourly fees. And um, you, you've been in the business 40 years, so this is not your first go around. Um, talk a little bit about your minimums and what is your average client size? So our uh, minimum is a uh, five million in liquid investable assets. Um, typical clients have net worths of ten to a hundred million, and uh, it's common that we work with multiple generations and uh, 
wings of families. Uh, if if somebody's listening right now and says, oh gosh, you know, uh, your net worth for your clients is just nowhere near uh, in my own personal network, why is it valuable? Uh, is the process the same for somebody who has less money than more money? And if they talk to you, uh, can you help them out in finding a, an advisor? Yes, the process is definitely the same. It's really kind of interesting how much it's the same. And uh, generally people's concerns are the same, uh, no matter the asset level. So for sure, it's all it's universal. And um, I actually uh, spend a lot of time help trying to help people find the right advisor. I, I was the program director uh, at UCI of the Certified Financial Planning Program for 20 years. So um, I know a good number of the advisors in the area. Most of them were probably my students <laughs> at some point, many of them. Um, and we actually um, vet uh, the people we don't know. If there's an advisor that someone said, you know, you should know them, we, we kind of meet with them and uh, make sure that they're truly fee only, that they don't have a secret insurance license or something like that, that they really do financial planning, have a reasonable investment process um, before we refer them out. And I try to match the um, client situation with the advisor as well. Okay, let's go to your outline and uh, we'll get started. All right. By the way, uh, Laura's ask first form is on the website and as well as her outline. So uh, uh, let's go through it. All right, so everybody, yep, there that is. Um, and more information on the firm. And today we're going to do a case study as a way to kind of uh, wrap up what uh, has happened the last few weeks in these sessions. And uh, I know Pete and Don are going to chime in um, on this a little bit too. Uh, so we're going to use Bill and Sue Brooks, uh, 72 years old, retired, a total net worth of about four million, two and a half of that is uh, liquid investments. And they have uh, two children and three grandchildren. So pretty typical situation. So first step for them is to find an advisor. They're looking for a new advisor. Um, I'm sure that it's been drilled into those of you who have attended the last many sessions that uh, really the most important thing you can do if you're working with an advisor is find somebody who has the right um, practice structure, meaning they're not affiliated with a broker dealer, they're not selling things, they're not um, incentivized or compensated by uh, outside outside uh, providers or um, shareholders, that sort of thing. And by so, the way, and in, in, in you've been in around the industry for 40 years. Is that common that they get uh, uh, other sources uh, pay them? Yes, it's very common, and, and it's really surprised me that it's still as common as it is. I thought I would have thought our industry uh, would have come farther by now, but I'll tell you, there's a lot more money to be made on the product side, and that's why people don't switch. And I actually get uh, people I've known in the industry for a long time coming to me to talk about how they can switch to a fee-only fiduciary practice, and they start asking questions. Well, how do you get commission trails on money market funds? <laughs> and it's like, you don't, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they realize there's so much more money on the other side. A lot of them are just not willing to make that switch. And we're going to talk a little bit about, so, you know, the annuities, the partnerships, the mutual funds, the reverse mortgages, the gosh, you know, those are all products that are laden with commissions. Right. And it's not that we don't make a good living and we're not in business to make a profit, but it really is. I can tell you this, um, having mentored so many financial advisors, having been having taught for so many years, it's a different kind of person who ends up on the fee only fiduciary side. It's people who really love the planning, who really care more about the clients. Uh, it's yeah. very different. On the yeah. other oh. side, advisors have a lot more clients on the on the commission side than they do on the fiduciary side. What always amazes me is is, is that somebody is uh, managing. Uh, uh, a ton of money and they don't even have a CFP designation, right. which is to me, it's almost like you don't even have a high school education. Right. right. You know, it's not, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not a PhD. Right. 
Right. Uh, what is the what does a CFP stand for? So certified financial planner. Uh, it's generally you know there's certain requirements you have to meet uh, as far as experience, um, you know, college degree and um, background checks and and so on. It's a, usually approximately a two year program and then a um, I think six hour uh, licensing exam that you take. You have ethics requirements and annual filings that you have to meet. Also. It's a designation, not a license. Well, it's actually a license. A license by a private. My little, my little mark is supposed to have a registered trademark thing, yeah. and it is a license because the CFP board can take it away from you. Yeah, but it's not a government license. It's not a government license, true. Yeah. Um, and th where that comes into play is as a registered investment advisor, um, you know, we are registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And that is what FINRA is about. Talk a little bit about that. Right. So FINRA is where you can go on their website, FINRA. Is it FINRA.org? Well, just, oh, you know, what I usually tell people is just Google broker check. Yeah, that's right. So broker check. And so if you go on to broker check, for me, you should get steered over to the SEC website because I'm not licensed as a broker dealer. But that's a way to find out if anybody has any. Um, dings on their record. And there are very few FINRA registered advisors who don't have dings on their record. In, in fact, you know, when I used to do the, the financial planning one, I had the screen up that talked about all of the um, legal actions that I had found on advisors, like in the last couple of months, like yeah. murder, car theft. You know, crazy. If you have not looked up your broker, it's a great idea to do that. And you could also look up the broker dealer. Now, what is that? A broker, and what is a broker dealer? So, a broker dealer um, is is could be anything from Charles Schwab to Merrill Lynch. It's it's actually the place where trades are executed. Advisors who are licensed with a broker dealer actually work for that broker dealer. So, I have to work with a broker dealer to execute trades for my clients, and we work with Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, but we don't work for them. We can work with any broker dealer, and I'm not beholden to them. Uh, but other uh, advisors who work for those broker dealers are paid by by them, and um, you know. Yeah. Okay. We uh, the ADV form is kind of like a prospectus for the personal advisor. Right. It's a, you're required to uh, update that every year with the SEC, and it gives some basic information about your business. Uh, and we'll disclose if you do have an insurance license, a real estate license, um, something like that will be on the ADB form. Why do you all say of that, that is you also on the ask for first yeah, form, which is yeah. a much uh, more succinct way to get that information. You say interview for three potential advisors. Uh, why would you but do before that? Before you do that, why is it that I should only go to a fee only? What if I also want to have a broker? Can I do both? Can I have a broker who says, well, I have an option. I can either do work for you as a fee only, or I can do it as a broker. Which one would you like me to be? And that, that's a great question. So that's a duly registered advisor, um, which is not fee only. And a, and a lot of times people will use the term fee based, um, and that is not fee only. So that I would guess that even if they work on a fee basis, if they agree to work on a fee basis, you should know that they may be trying to sell you insurance. They will typically have an insurance license. By uh, the way, you can have five different medical doctors. You can have, you know, you, it, it, I don't know how, what kind of advantage it would be for you if you have more than one advisor. It's uh, you, you can always go to another advisor. Then why, then Pete, why do you have more than one doctor? Uh, because you have specialists. OK, so but I could I, have a specialist. I could have a fee only advisor over here. But then over on the other side, I could have someone who's just a straight broker. So I, pl CFP, I play devil's advocate with you, Pete. I know. I know. Yeah, so I a CFP by nature is a generalist. And that's okay. what's really unique about the CFP is you learn about taxes, you learn about estate planning, you learn about retirement planning, you learn about investments, you learn about insurance, you learn about cash flow management. Um, you're, you're looking at all the pieces and um, you know we, we have a few clients that have accounts elsewhere, 
um, and we need we need to know about them so that we're looking at what's going on there. There the may picture. be a reason for that. So we have the whole picture. I mean, there's a lot of issues that come up from you know everything from retired you know RMDs, you know, getting the right you know getting all the accounts to account for that to um, wash sale rules. If one arm's doing something and the other doesn't know, you know, what trades are being made, you know, that creates some problems. Um, not to mention just having your asset allocation the way it should be. So yeah. And the other thing too, is like, for instance, uh, uh, just the insurance area in California, the insurance agent can't quote unquote, give you advice for an hourly fee because that's the law literally almost have to go out of state in order to find a uh, an insurance agent that will not will give you advice based on an hourly fee right right and, and, a, that, a, and, and a consumer and it, just wouldn't know those things right and you know, so, there are there yeah done so why should i interview three people because everybody has a different approach there are lots of different uh, investment styles that could make sense uh, there's different personalities and uh, you need to feel really comfortable with your advisor. You need to kind of connect with them. If you're not completely comfortable telling them everything, it's not, you know, like a doctor, it's not going to necessarily be a great relationship. You can't hide things from your advisor. Um, and, um, you know, their uh, personality is really important. Yeah. And there are different and, and, you know, I'm sure you've talked about nice is not, you know, the criteria you should use, but um, you, you want to be sure that you're comfortable with your advisor and that, and that the way that they work and the way that they um, their approach to investments makes sense to you because, you know, it, they sh really on the other side, on the broker side, I'm telling you, they have classes that teach you how to confuse your client. <laughs> and you know we're taking the opposite point of view we're trying to make things as clear as possible not trying to make you know trying to have the client understand it I, I can't tell you how many people have said to me you know my last advisor made me feel stupid and I was always afraid to ask questions and that's not obviously not a good, yeah. and good advice. to me it's almost like a marriage uh yeah. you know the last thing you want to do is jump around from one visor to another every two to five years so you want to you want to take some time up front to pick out the advisor that first of all is fee only that yep. has the proper credential that checks out as far as finery is concerned and then free is the that the personality fits with you you know it's uh because you're not going to listen to them if that personality is not Nice is important. It's just after all three of these uh, that you've taken a look at. Yep. yep. Um, and, let's go to the next slide. I just want to say one thing about nice because we were talking about this here uh, in our firm. It's like you also want somebody who's not going to be too nice, who's going to tell you what you need to hear and to be straightforward with you and give give you advice. Not just you know do what you know you think you want to do, but really give you good objective advice. And sometimes that may involve not being so nice. I well, will. it's kind of like uh, uh, the the recent uh, the the recent downturn in stocks. Uh, uh, being nice is okay. You stock market is a little bit volatile. Let's sell whatever amount in your um, portfolio is there and uh, reallocate at the moment's notice. So that's being too nice. Yep. What should have been said was, no, stick to the plan. We put a financial plan together. There's going to be downturns. I'm going to hold your hand through this, but we should not sell. Yep. Yep. And a lot of times it makes me think too, we, we act as a gatekeeper uh, on a lot of things when somebody's cousins trying to sell them an annuity that is not appropriate or a reverse mortgage, something like that. A lot of times we, you know, they can refer them to us and we'll vet that, that uh, person or product and kind of be a middleman. And by the uh, way, when you are guy. in sales, the first thing they tell you is hit up on all your family members. Right. The second thing they tell you is, do you belong to a church? <laughs> hit up everybody who's in your congregation yeah you know uh in your social clubs 
hit up everybody who's there. Uh, or do you belong to a nonprofit? Hit up all your board members. Yeah. So this yeah. is the sales mentality and it works. You know, sales people are a lot more fun to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go to the next slide. All right. So you've chosen your advisor and where do you start? Uh, obviously, um, you know, what do you, what are you seeking an advisor for? What are your goals? What are you looking for? Um, if you are married or have a partner, obviously you both need to participate in this. Um, you know, that's another situation I've seen a lot where the one of the spouses never really was involved. And uh, typically one of the spouses will be more interested than the other. But in this stage of um, the engagement, you definitely need to have everybody uh, involved. So um, this particular couple, um, Bill and Sue, they need help investing their retirement funds. And they want to make sure that their money's going to last. Are they spending, you know, are they spending too much or, or you know, are they okay there? Uh, also, they want to get their estate in order. They don't uh, have a trust in place, which is very common, surprisingly. Uh, and that also, it, uh, it doesn't vary a lot by asset level. I mean, I've seen people with 20 30 million dollars who didn't have uh, you know any estate planning in place believe it or not yeah. um, and they they also the, want to give to their favorite charities now some if they can and um, then after they are gone you know one of the things about that is is that there are a lot of people who say they want to make some gifts to charity but they feel like they just can't afford it they said we need money for ourselves and by the way the media doesn't engender um uh security they, they engender insecurity so how Absolutely. can you possibly give money away if you're insecure about having your money last for your lifetime right which is what's great about the financial planning process is as you'll be able to see that you if you do that you have enough and have some some comfort in that and you know i i just read within the last week um, that it was something like only five to six percent of people leave money to charity in their estate. I I was stunned that it was that low. Well, because uh, people are very insecure about having their money last. Yeah, but if it's in your estate, but you've if already it's in died. Your estate, that's not a good excuse. I also <laughs> think that it's something people don't always think a lot about. Yeah. Um, it's something that I guess a lot of attorneys don't bring up. Yeah. Uh, and again, that doesn't seem to vary much by asset level either, which is really crazy that, you know, some people with huge estates really have not um, done a lot in their estate planning to leave money to charity. So, um, you know, I think that's what part of why we're all involved is this is we really would like to see that increase. I mean, but, do you really wanna... want your kids to get 20 million each? I mean, I had that conversation with somebody recently. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Yeah. When you say you want it to let, have them make sure the money will last, what do you do as an age group? They can make it to 105. What do you do as a age oh, group? Uh, How far up? So we our default. Well, you know, um, our default. We don't really have a default. We use 95 or 100, okay. and it kind of depends. And and you know, usually we'll talk about that with the client, um, and. And I think usually we have to push people on that. We'll probably, you know, push it out a little farther because you can keep, you can adjust that. When you do these calculations, you don't just do them once. Um, and and it, by the way, and every single year when you do them, they're refined. You oh, get yeah. to know a little bit more. You get to see the history. Yep. Yeah, life happens and everything changes. That's why, you know, in the early days of financial planning, there was so much time and software time to in, in in the development of these plans that gave you these numbers and we used to say you know this is kind of crazy because the client walks out the door and something changes and the numbers are all different so you know we're this is something you need to have um you need to have the tools as an advisor to be able to do these kind of things on a regular basis it's not a one-time thing you yeah let's to go to the next slide there Laura. on an ongoing basis so uh as a a uh, client working with an advisor and the advisor should be gathering information. Um, the first thing we're going to do is create a balance sheet. So we need to know what all the assets are, what, um, you know, the estimated 
values of any real estate, mortgages, um, you know, all of all of the retirement assets and um, uh, cash assets, et cetera, to see what the overall net worth is and where everything is. And I know. That How does that fit into a divorce settlement? 50-50. Yeah. <laughs> well, the question was, can, so can a financial advisor then help with yeah. in a collaborative divorce yes. of saying, yes, here are yes, the yes. assets, back, here's what back. we're doing. Uh, stop sharing the screen for a second. I mean, uh, come yeah. on. Just, uh, I think that's a, it, you, you hit on really two important topics. One is divorce. How do I mean, are, do you find estate planning attorneys or our family law attorneys are familiar with uh, family assets? No, or the tax law? No, not at all. Um, and, you know, there's actually a, a designation, a certified divorce financial analyst. So people, uh, usually CFPs who go on and get that designation, who have special training and some of the child custody arrangements and all that. But um, it's, we have served many times as um, kind of mediators, forensic accountants um, to keep clients out of getting into a really contentious situation. Um, we had a couple of years ago, I think the year before COVID, we actually had three divorces, which was a whole lot given our uh, small client, relatively small client base. And with all of those clients, we've retained both spouses, which I think is pretty unusual. Actually, one of them we didn't really want, but, um, <laughs> but I think um, one of the things is we were able to have them see that it was in, they all had children. It was in the family's interests for them to kind of work together separately going forward. And we were a good bridge to help them be able to do that. What I, I find- It's pretty straightforward. I mean, you know, there's- It's 50-50, but it, you know, uh, not all assets are equal. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing that I that I see a lot of is, is when the one of the couple members die and then the surviving spouse is hammered by their children as to what to do. And and especially it, it, it's dang, not dangerous, but it's sad when the spouse who had control of the money for the family is the spouse that died. Right, right. Yeah, and we definitely get involved in a lot of those situations. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's helpful to have an objective, uh, somewhat objective party involved in that, for sure. That, that's definitely an issue. It's, and it's, there's no, you know, those are the things where there is no right answer on, on how that's handled. But, you know, what? that's we... We talk through a lot of the, you know, the family dynamics and the personal situations, and and we've seen a lot of situations. And it, it is it's interesting because people always want to know, well, what does everybody else do in this situation? And is yeah, it what's normal? Do... Normal? There's nothing yeah. normal anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and that's where we go back to you know your slide by by actually looking at what is the balance sheet? How old are you? What kind of goals do you have? Yeah, you, those questions need to be answered. What is your present cash flow? Yeah, and and when you have a spouse that just died, or when you're going through a divorce, these are highly emotional situations where it's hard to think straight. Yeah, yeah. So go. Let's go back to. Um, uh, by the way, whoops. Why is it important to understand the budget? and uh, not a budget, your cash flow and your goals. Why yeah. do we do that first? Well, what, one is spending. And, you know, I, I mean, the majority of people that we work with now have um, either retired or reached financial independence and, and are drawing from their portfolios and, and we want to know what, how much can we spend? What would be the maximum? And there's lots of different ways you can solve for this you, you know people could say i need to spend this much and then you can figure out okay well you need to get x returns so that means your asset allocation should look a certain way um but a lot of times it's just like let's figure out what the maximum is just so we know what that is and you know very few people will will spend that max i mean there there are people who will and again that needs to be adjusted and it's not as straightforward a calculation as you would think it's not you know the software programs out there um, some of the consumer ones aren't, you know, 
as complete as they need to be. It makes a big difference if all your money is in IRAs. If all your money has not yet been taxed, that's very different than if your money's in taxable accounts. Let's example. go to the next slide. So just, I wanna just um, say this particular couple, um, were, uh, they have social security combined of 3,600, pension income of 1,800. So that's 64,000 plus a year that they're getting. And they they need they want to spend 150,000, so that means they need 85,000 from their portfolio, which is about 3.4 percent of that um, two and a half million liquid. So we'll we'll tie that back in when we look at what their asset allocation should be. But if but if today my I, my 401k is still with my prior employee employer, I want to be able to do something with this, but. If I move that now to an IRA outside of my employer, transfer it outside of my employer, aren't I going to lose a lot of money today because of the way the market is? Um, it depends on you, how. See, Laura, you... the problem is you're not a lawyer, so you can't just say <laughs> it depends. It depends. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, well, it depends if you buy back in right away because you're you'd be selling, you know, at a decline, but you're also buying back in at a lower point. So and, and that was my first thought was, well, yeah. it's a, it's a push because once up, yeah. one's down. You know, they're both down, therefore you can move across it. Right. Because what the issue became, the the person wants to be able to give money to to charity, but the employer is saying you can't take it out of your four hundred one k. Right. So right. what's the option? And yeah, you have a lot more flexibility money. in the IRA. Right. So, okay. Little what less. Are the one of the biggest issues is procrastination. So, yeah. in and life in so, general, yes, yeah. that's true. <laughs> yeah. So, there's so many excuses. The market is down. I can't move the money. Right. I haven't decided as to who gets the furniture. Therefore, right. I can't do the estate plan. Right. Right. Uh, as my spouse just died, so I can't work on i mean there is a hundred and one but but pete if the market's down shouldn't i do a roth ira conversion now uh, possibly that's why you need an advisor <laughs> what's the last item review tax most, return yeah most but things that's... aren't irrevocable but a few things are yeah, um, yeah. And i just want to mention before we leave the slide reviewing the tax return super important um we we do that regularly to you know just make sure everything's good another set of eyes on it if we're not preparing that. We need to know what tax bracket people are and we need to know what, what's going on. Is there a loss carry forward? Was there a property sold last year? There's a lot of opportunities for tax planning. Are CPAs say. good financial advisors? <laughs> um, no. No. <laughs> um, but people yeah. trust their, their, their anything, a C, uh, they're the most trusted designation in the country. Right. Well, and I and, would say that in general, CPAs are trustworthy. I just think that it's it's really kind of mind blowing how little they know about a lot of uh, parts of financial planning, like insurance and um, investment planning and investments and how yes. how they work. Um, they so know they understand taxes if that's the area that they're working in or they understand audits if that's the area they're working in it doesn't mean just because they do your tax return that they understand about money right there's and there's there's so there's so many moving parts there's so there's so much to know um which is one of the things i love about this because there's always new stuff to know it's always changing um, I depend on a whole team to keep up on things and, you know, all the continuing education that we all do and the colleagues that we call on for special situations where we don't have a lot of experience. There's a lot to know. Yeah. And most fee only advisors, if they're truly fee only, they're not selling insurance and they may not know a lot about insurance, but hopefully they are connected to insurance advisors where they can refer out and get proposals and get input and then they can be an objective eye on things. And I have the insurance review as kind of the next step. It's not necessarily the first thing we do, but I, in financial planning, you're kind of taught to make sure everything's protected before you look at how you invest in the estate planning and everything. Make sure you have your basic insurance in place. So. Uh, for the, for this couple, definitely their Medicare supplement insurance. Um, you know, we have great resources for that. Um, some of the folks we use make sure that they check it every year. If your prescriptions have changed, it may make sense to switch to a different provider, all that sort of thing. Long-term care insurance. We've had many people have, um, 
you know, issues and proposals from their long-term care provider about taking a different option. Um, and we can advise on that. Um, we review homeowners, auto, auto and personal liability insurance. We can do a basic review, but usually we will outsource to uh, a property casualty specialist to get input on that. And then life insurance. Uh, most people have some old life insurance policies and a lot of times they don't need them or uh, there are changes that should be made. And probably most often, uh, if these were any kind of um, uh, variable or universal life policies, they were you know, set up on certain assumptions that may or may not have played out and they may be underfunded and people don't know that they're gonna lapse in a couple of years, those kind of things. So life yeah, insurance needs to be managed also. We, we just recently yesterday had a fire here in uh, the Laguna Beach area, Laguna Niguel area. And, uh, and I was talking to an insurance property casualty insurance agent. And he said, what he's seeing because of the cost of construction and goods that the homeowner's insurance is not up to date. So use this event is to check out your homeowner's insurance to see if it's absolutely replacement cost. If for heaven's sakes, does something happens to your home? Yep, yep. And if you have a good agent, they should be proactive in that, but most aren't. There's there, there, there's not enough commission on the property casualty side. Yep. And so uh, when they get uh, the renewals without doing the reviews. Yeah. So um, and and most everybody should have um an umbrella liability policy. You know, yeah. at least a million, maybe up to five million, and they're really cheap. And they're and I, we always say that. A lot of people don't have them because the agents don't mention them because there's like ten dollars commission. There's very yeah. little commission on them. Yeah. And, and Pete, I was noticing on the news last this morning, rather, they were showing this one house which unfortunately was had burned. It happened to be on the market for ten million dollars. Yeah. And I thought my first thought was, and his insurance is not going to be ten million because of land. And so it's like, okay, this is an interesting question now, but it, it literally was, they showed the ad, the brochure for the property at 10 million. I yeah. thought, okay. Yeah, yeah, it'd be really interesting to see how all the claims yeah. play out. On right that. now, the insurance agent was telling me that he, that most of his clients are underinsured. Yeah, I'm sure. Anyway, uh, again, so. And the other thing I would say, just one more thing, we always get asked about earthquake insurance and I have serious earthquake paranoia. Um, having grown up in Southern California when I was younger and there were so many earthquakes and were so overdue, um, but it depends on what area you are in. In some areas, it's relatively inexpensive um, and it's, it's cheaper now because there haven't been a lot of claims, so the premiums are lower. Um, but in some areas, it's, it's, it is much higher, maybe prohibitive, but definitely something you could, should consider if you own a home. Tax planning. So tax planning, um, super important part uh, of what we do. Uh, you know, actually, uh, we were talking to somebody who came from Merrill Lynch. Actually, we were interviewing somebody who came from Merrill Lynch, which has never worked out for us before, but I was going to try one more time. And she, <laughs> she was the financial planner on the team at, at this team of like four or five brokers at Merrill Lynch. And she, she was a CFP and they were not allowed to do tax planning. Like, how can you be a financial planner and not be allowed to do tax planning? I mean, really for her, she was just processing checks and maybe running a canned retirement proposal. It's like, you don't do tax planning. Well, you know, the brokerage firms are very paranoid about liability. Yeah. And so if they somehow make a mistake in the tax planning area, they could be looking at a, a lawsuit. Well, and there's no direct money in it there's no yeah, commission there's exactly. no it's not really built into their business no. model to be doing more for people you and, yeah. and, she, and she said yes they wanted us to do as little as possible for the clients that was like the mantra of merrill lynch you know behind the scenes anyway so uh qualified charitable distributions um are have been pretty popular when they um change the required minimum distribution to age 72 they left the qcd age at 70 and a half that's where you can give up to 100,000 a year from your IRA directly to charities. Uh, a great tool. We have a lot of people taking advantage of that. Um, and, and along that line, the other thing that we've had a lot of people doing is batching their charitable contributions. So since they 
they reduced the um, amount uh, deduction that we can take on property taxes and state taxes to the $10,000 cap, uh, lots of people were not itemizing anymore. So we suggest that people batch their charitable contributions so that they get over that hump maybe every other year, every three or four years, and then one year they can take that deduction. So those are the kind of planning things that we look at. Um, that's one of the ways that we use donor advised funds. It's like give a big chunk to a donor advised fund and then dole it out to charities in the future years. Um, Roth conversions, lots of people ask about these. Um, you know, there's certainly opportunities where it makes sense. I, we do a lot of analysis. I would say nine out of 10 times, it doesn't make sense. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a big decision to pay taxes before you have to. <laughs> Usually, I mean, you have to, it has to be pretty low rate for that to make sense to, to do a Roth conversion. Yeah, just because you hear that uh, the, um, the Roth gives out tax-free income, you, it, it, you, you need the analysis. You can't just assume off the top of your head that this is the right thing to do. And if somebody doesn't dig into your situation as to whether or not it's good for you, you're not probably making the correct decision. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's so difficult. They, and things are changing. The tax laws are changing. Things are proposed. Is the backdoor Roth in? Is it out? Um, there's like, it's really, really tough to plan. I mean, you really need someone who's on top of it. Yeah. Um, right now, tax loss harvesting is a great, uh, a great pastime. Uh, there's some great opportunities to rebalance and um, take some tax losses in your portfolio. Um, and we actually, you know, it's, it's tough for us when we have a period of the market just going straight up um, to be as tax efficient as we like. Uh, when we have a, a time like this, we're able to sell some assets and, and buy other assets, sell ones that have um, not done as well, or has, have done well, not done as well, balance them off. I mean, there's just a lot of opportunities if you're looking at the underlying details of a portfolio. So like we're, do, we're super busy um, doing tax loss trading right now. And um, would you say that a financial advisor, if they don't look at your tax return, they're not really giving you a good service? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They have to understand your, you, if you're going to do it yourself, you need to understand your taxes. Yes, yep. Um, and tax bracket planning, that's kind of part of that, you know, taking, sometimes it might make sense to take more money out of your IRA, more than your RMD, even if you have a loss somewhere else to offset. I mean, there's a lot of planning to kind of keep you from going into the next highest tax bracket. We use it a lot sometimes when uh, uh, we have a client that becomes in uh, a board and care so that uh, all of a sudden they, their medical expenses exceed that 7%. Right. And then we, we couple that with a withdrawal of the IRA account because now it's almost tax-free. Yep, up to a certain amount you get some yeah, it's money just, out. Tax planning is just huge. Let's go to yep. the next slide. No, yep. let's stay there. All righty, yes, God. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you're you're my financial planner, hypothetical. I understand. If you don't have a conflict of interest, you're not. Um, but I want to go ahead and do a QCD. Do I process that through you, or for the for the custodial brokerage account? Actually, uh, you process that through us. And okay. it goes through the custodial account. Right. Okay. Hopefully, your advisor isn't saying call, you know, call Schwab and ask them to do it. So we, I, we know a firm that they don't do any of that servicing. <laughs> okay. So, but if you're doing that or any kind of, you know, um, batch my contributions or something else as an advisor, you will help me facilitate that if that's what I want to have done. Yep. yep. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing we do on, on tax is we do like a, um, we call it a tax package each year for our clients for their CPA. These are all the things that you need to know as a CPA that this client did. Because a lot of times the CPAs aren't asking the questions. I mean, a lot of them will use a questionnaire, but the clients don't usually like to fill that out. Um, and, you know, things happen, things are different during the year and things change. And we're usually on top of that enough to let the CPA know. So um, we would give the- Can I jump in ahead of Pete here? No, you can't. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> but but it's one of the reasons why you can't have 5,000 clients. 
Right. You, I think it's one of those questions that you need to ask your financial advisor. How many clients do you actually have? Or what is your ratio of, of fee-only advisors to the number of clients you have? Right. Yep. Because it takes time. Yes, Don. Yep. <laughs> and because we talk a lot about qualified charitable distributions, a QCD. First of all, it's important. The way the question was asked, asked, I want to answer it this way. You can do a qualified charitable distribution from your retirement account once you are 70 and a half. RMD doesn't start until 72. Someone in writing the tax law a while back didn't bother to put the two of them together. So there's this odd little year and a half gap. So right. if someone wants to give money through QCD after 70 and a half, they don't have to have taken an RMD yet. Right. It, it is deductible. It, and it's, oddly, a QCD is not deductible. It becomes no income. Right. Which is it better. better comes in. Therefore, it's 100% deductible. You don't have to worry about it on your itemized deduction or on your standard deduction. So you can take it, but... It's important. In fact, somebody the other day tried to send me a statement on, here's the, the documentation on your deduction. It isn't a deduction. Right. It wasn't income. Right. Now, you know, as a CPA, yeah. right. I, I know that. And right. so that's, but that was the way the question went. So I just want to make sure we covered that. Let's yep. go to the next slide. Yes. Yep. So um, now we get to the investment portfolio uh, and thinking of this couple, how do we design the investment portfolio? I always have to get this in here. I knew you guys had sessions on this, but no annuities. Um, you know, there's lots of different kinds. There are a very, very small number of situations where they may make sense, um, but they're, they're, they're I'm going to add the word so commercial in front of your annuity, not charitable annuity. Yes. Thank yes, you. Yes, yes. Charitable annuities are great. Some immediate annuities can make sense, um, but you know most of the other ones are are not good. They're very difficult to get out of. Very expensive, and and the worst thing is to die with them because it, I mean you still don't get a tax break. So um, I think you probably had enough of, of that. But no annuities will be um, in the mix here. So um, I know you've you've been through this if you've attended the other sessions, but. Um, we start out with what is the asset allocation going to be and kind of, first of all, what asset classes are going to be used. I think most advisors don't include your real estate in, you know, the, the your home, of, correct, the, your home, not your home. And even rental real estate, you know, may be considered because there's maybe some underlying real estate type holdings, real estate investment trusts that we would use in the liquid portfolio. And if somebody has a lot of um, rental real estate, we, we might not do that. So, you know, assuming is, are there any asset classes we want to exclude or anything? So, so when you meet with a, like say with the Brooks, is the first thing you do is kind of, where are they? Yes, yes. So that, yes, and I, di I didn't uh, put that in the process. You know, I could assume that they just got a rollover and it was cash, which is really easy for us, but that never happens. Never happens. So usually, <laughs> Um, we're doing some upfront analysis on what they have. Um, we need all the cost basis information and um, to see what we want to change. So we will typically uh, come back with kind of a proposal of, of a transition plan. You know, what I see a lot is somebody goes into a, a broker or um, sometimes it happens even with a financial advisor. They immediately sell the entire portfolio like it is cash. Yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a advisor here who's not really a financial planner, but he's a fee only investment guy, and he always sells 100 percent of the portfolio, which is God, crazy. Crazy. Yeah, it's uh, can be super damaging. So um, you so, first got to figure out where are you. Right, and so uh, it can take us <laughs> eight years to transition a portfolio because we don't want to take the capital gains and and we time it. Um, and in some cases, we have to hold on to certain holdings because there's such a built up gain. It would just take so much to overcome that, that there may be holdings that we, we never sell. And there's ways actually to work around that um, sometimes. But um, typically, it's a year or two to transition a portfolio, depending on um, how much of the um, assets are in taxable accounts with, with tax issues. So give us a de quick definition of an asset class. So. Um, So these are asset classes. And this is, this is kind of an example of our moderate growth portfolio that's a little 
more growthy that, than a 60-40 portfolio. It's about 65% um, stocks and 35% bonds. So emerging market stocks is an asset class, small cap U.S. stocks asset class, U.S. core bonds an asset class. Okay, with the Brooks needed 3.4% return on their investment portfolio. Right. Is, so, would this kind of portfolio, which portfolio would fit for them? So, and it's not as straightforward as that because we will run a more detailed analysis, which I'll get into in a minute because it, you know, how much of that two and a half million is in IRAs, how much is not in IRAs, all affects really what rate of return you need. But that for these type of portfolios, generally, we would say a stable growth portfolio will give you four to five percent return a year. Conservative growth would be five to six, moderate growth, six to seven, and growth would be eight plus. And it's interesting because I finally reviewed all of our um, clients' quarterly reports um, this week. And, um, and um, you know, we have many clients who've been here actually um, a couple that have been here 40 the 40 years but uh, we are right even with the decline you know right on target with you know on the on the high end because we've had a great run of the you know five to six percent has been six percent i'm like i mean across the board i mean this this is um you know not based on current market dynamics is these are long-term uh rates of return that you could expect so i would say if we ran all the the what we call sustainable spending, I would say I wouldn't want them to go stable. I don't want many people to go stable. I think that's way, way too concerned unless they're super, super skittish or they have tons of money and they don't need to get much return. They could go conservative growth or moderate growth. Um, and growth would usually be for people who are not retired, who are still adding to their portfolio, though I have some very aggressive retired clients who like to be growth. And um, Actually and then them. where does risk come in? So um, potential return, you know, on the growth of your side and more risk, you know, more growth. So um, the stable portfolio, obviously much lower risk and volatility. Um, this year has been crazy and it's kind of thrown everybody off because the bond market has been so challenged that bonds are down, you know, uh, quite a bit also, not as much as stocks, but bonds are down too. So stable portfolios are, are you know, underwater a little bit this year too. Um, that's a temporary phenomenon that is expected in a period of rising interest rates. Um, but long-term, that's a, 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 a more stable place, obviously, to be without a lot of volatility. So are you changing individuals' plans right now because of the fact that uh, uh, there's turmoil in the world? No, we're trying to talk people out of changing their plans, <laughs> um, you know, because we'll get people calling and saying, okay, well, what are you doing? Um, you know, and the only way that you lose money in the market is to sell into a down market. And all of our clients have enough in cash or fixed income to last, uh, you know, five to seven years typically of their spending needs. So for the Brooks, you would never put uh, monies in equity um, that they couldn't meet their spending needs of $150,000 a year for at least two, three, four years. Right. Right. And, and if you're, you know, if you, we always say if somebody has money, they want to invest in the stock market. If you need it in the next three to five years, you shouldn't be investing at all in the market. So do you do a net worth statement for them on an annual basis? Uh, we do, we do. And then the other um, very important thing that we do is this sustainable spending analysis. And this is all, you know, capital needs analysis, retirement income, we call it sustainable spending um, because so many of our clients aren't trying to get to retirement, they're already there. So how much, you know, can you um, spend over your lifetime? So how much do you have? Um, how much do you need? any other um, savings, inheritance. Um, it's, an inheritance is always tricky whether you factor that in or not um, because it's, you know, for some people, it's pretty certain they're gonna get a certain amount, a pretty definable amount at some point. So sometimes we'll calc yeah, calculate that. And usually we would run two analyses with and without. 
Um, a lot, most people don't want to include that or count on it, but in some cases it's very clear. We have someone, an only child, dad is 95, you know, within the next 10 years, this money's going to come to them and that, and they, and they are going to need it because they've been overspending because he knew that money was there. <laughs> um, what is the impact of inflation and taxes? You know, big, uh, very important. Um, as everybody knows, inflation's 8.3% uh, uh, right now. Uh, typically, we have been using 3.5% as a long-term inflation number. Um, we're actually going to be having a meeting about whether we should change that because we look, we're looking very far out. Um, and there, it, and uh, we were talking earlier about the the New York Times Daily. Well, there was a different article that you were referencing, Pete. Everybody's mad about inflation. There's that one, but there was a, a, a podcast this morning about um, how inflation affects everybody so differently, depending on what phase of life you're on. Whether you have kids at home and you're needing to buy food, whether you need to buy a new car, whether you're commuting to work. I mean, some people aren't being as impacted as others. And uh, when you're in retirement, it's very different uh, things that you're spending money on maybe. Uh, and inflation is, is important. The picture that I'm getting from you, Laura, is, is, is that your job is not about the outside world. Your job is to understand what the person that you're dealing with is going through. Yep. And, and yet, for most of us, we think of, oh, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Therefore, my personal portfolio must be going the same way. Right. And, and and it's not about that. It's all about, you know, the person. Right. Well, and that's, you know, the other thing is, what should I invest in now? Or I've got some extra money. What should I invest in? And what's hot right now? I mean, that's not at all the way that um, you should look at it. And, and, you know, how we invest money um, for 20 plus years now hasn't changed at all. And, and I, you know, I've been through quite a few market cycles and ups and downs and, you know, long term, um, stocks are a great inflation hedge, and you're going to make money in the stock market. And you can just we go back to the uh, to to your sustainable, yeah, your asset allocation chart. The not that one, the other. Yes. Yeah. Talk so a little bit about go around the circle. Yeah. So this this is um, you know probably where the bulk of our client assets are in our moderate growth model. And that's um, you know typically seven percent return target when we're using um, when we're doing our sustainable spending analysis. It, if, if you're in a moderate growth, we'll use seven percent, and I say over you know long period of time, that's that's been where we are. So um, U.S. large cap stocks, and we we index the core. What uh, does that mean? So that means we're um, not trying to pick winners and losers. We're buying the market in index. So when we want large company stocks, I, I want the market exposure, large company stocks. Um, you're, we have you're, clients. You're talking value. You're talking growth. growth. You're yep. talking S&P 500. S&P 500 is what we use. We um, don't we don't try to make calls on value and growth. Um, that can, that's a, an approach that makes sense to some people. Uh, there are lots of um, firms that have focused on value investing. That's really um, been a tough place to be for 10 years, but um, we don't make that call typically. And, so um, and so where, where would you find uh, large cap stocks? I mean, uh, as a category, how do you know if you invest in a mutual fund, if you're investing in large cap stocks in the objective? Yeah, when the prospectus and, you know, and the Morningstar report should tell you, not necessarily the name, yes. <laughs> not always accurate. Um, but I was to say a lot of clients will call up and want to buy Apple, Google or whatever. And the S&P 500 has a ton of those stocks so that all of our clients do own those stocks and have <laughs> benefit or, or, or not, depending on, on the market. Um, mid cap is a, a category that we call out separately. I would say more firms don't than do. Uh, most firms that we see have just large and small company stocks, but mid cap has done very well for us. It's the, it's the companies that have kind of grown out of the small the small cap uh, category, but they're not quite large enough. It's a, been a really good sector and uh, moves differently than the others. And, but, and for us having the small, the mid and the large, 
that's where we are able to rebalance a little bit if if because one will typically do better than the other long term small cap performs better than mid cap then large but we've been in a large cap market for several years now um so you know we've been able to buy more small cap because they haven't done as well and that's where we can rebalance among the categories when you say rebalance uh, what you actually sell large cap stock uh, like say you invest in a mutual fund that does large cap stocks. So you sell some of those funds? Yeah, you sell the thing that's up and buy the thing that's down. In an IRA, you know, with impunity, uh, in taxable accounts, it's a lot tougher. So um, that's where now we may take something um, out of an area that's down, like, you know, emerging markets and sell some of the um, large cap and offset it with some of the emerging market losses and so and international what is uh so in international developed is the the major economies um europe and and japan and so on emerging markets is less developed um we have the ukraine war going on i mean should we be putting money in the international community i mean the the stock market is much safer here in the u.s um, Ukraine would be beyond emerging markets. That would probably that would be probably frontier market. However, we do buy frontier market bonds. We have a frontier market bond um, fund, which is a safer way to play those less developed markets, and we get a lot more yield. And that's done not great for us this year, but um, prior years has um, had our bonds outperform um, by getting a little higher yield. So uh, but talk the a little bit of core bonds. Talk talk a little bit about diversification how important diversification is so it's the most important thing it's going to be the driver of your returns and um uh, it's really amazing that most of the brokerage firms still only invest in large company stocks uh, so seldom do we see these other categories and then you know maybe core bonds treasuries very little real diversification um, as I say, small and large stocks run at different times, international and U.S. run at different times. Um, I would say we're actually on um, the lower end in our international exposure. Some firms go up to 30 percent overall in international. Um, but the U.S. stock market, we, we overweight that as a whole because we feel like that's a, a better place to be probably long term. But there yeah. are times when international international is underperformed actually for many years um some someday they will probably ha have a comeback but this and is this has a, been a really good core allocation um through all market cycles and the diversification gives you the safety the less uh, less volatility yes but you, Lower can, risk. you can over diversify too Okay. It's at a certain point you lose value uh, in diversification. You, you can't over diversify. But yes, this is, um, you know, you don't necessarily want too many categories. You lose kind of the, so, and so every year for your clients, you do a pie? Yeah, we're, and you know, we're always, yeah, it's on all our reports. We have the pies that we're reporting on and we're constantly, a lot of people ask, well, how often are you rebalancing? How often are you looking at this? And we have um, lots of metrics set up in our trading software where things are triggered for us to look at, whether we should rebalance, whether we should sell some of this, buy some of that. And we never do a blanket trade. We look at each client's situation, each client's account. We need, that's why we need the tax return. We wanna know what tax bracket they're in this year. Is it make sense to make this trade and sell this stock that has X amount of gain? And we kind of actually have a capital gains budget for each client of, of a certain amount of gain that we're willing to take or that we can take in a certain year. Yeah. Uh, so and a lot of this is going on, it, all is going on behind the scenes. And a lot yeah. of people don't realize- But, but every person ought to be able to put together a net worth statement every year. And a pie. And a pie, because that's gonna give you a kind of a sense of where you are, not the daily news, not CNBC, yeah. not any media whatsoever yeah and and you're you're you know you're better you're always better off doing nothing on your portfolio than making making quick decisions i mean there, there's been amazing studies by the mutual fund companies that show 
you know, the average return of the investor compared to the average return of a fund or market. And the average investor return is so low because they're getting in and out at the wrong time. And, yeah. it, and it's true for many advisors too. A lot of that, that, that is- Doing uh, nothing is usually the best answer. Yeah, you can only do damage to your portfolio um, if you sell at the wrong time. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so anyway, this sustainable spending, super important. Um, we will typically do this every two to three years. We'll update this or if something changes in somebody's life, you know, a retirement, a house sale, a death, something like that, or just, you know, people are getting nervous and thinking they are spending too much or they want to spend more, you know, what could we do? do you know, maybe it, it's, you know, if you want to spend more, you have to move from conservative growth to moderate if you hope to sustain that over time. So that- I, I just had a conversation with my uh, sister uh, who just uh, developed Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, the time, it, and she's in the early stages. And I said, this is the time right now. You love to travel. You have a goal of, uh, of, of going on a safari. Uh, and I go, I go, this is the time to do it. Yep. And she cannot do it because she's spending money and she's saved throughout her entire life. Do you assist people <laughs> in spending their money? Yes, yes. And that's what I'm saying all the time. I, I, this is your money. It's not your kids. I mean, people like, do you really want to give your kids that much? And people deny themselves so often. Um, and I'm, you know, it's actually, I think a lot about it and I'm giving most of my money away. I don't want to give my child all my money because I've seen that that's usually not a good thing. I think I think it, uh, I can be a much better example to her um, by, by doing other things with my, my money and giving a lot of it away. Um, but you have to do, you have to run the numbers and you have to see what that looks like. You definitely want to make sure you have enough for your needs, but people tend to, to worry too much that they don't have enough when they do. And certainly you, you want to, there's that balance of being able to spend it when you're healthy. And we're, we're very often telling people to spend more. Um, yeah. yeah. Had, had one of those conversations just yesterday. I, I, I find like, it so yeah, I know, but it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's so sad because she, she has like three to $4 million in assets and um, she she finds it. She's looking for absolute bargains for yeah. her to take a trip. Yeah, and I well, go, and that, never yeah. that never changes. That never changes. Yeah, <laughs> you know, um, you could go business class. Yeah, you know? the, the, the client I I think you I've told you about Pete, who you know at 15, 16 million, and she said, Laura, you don't understand it. Like Goodwill, there's like a whole row of black pants. You could have any type of black pants. <laughs> like yeah. you can only shop at Goodwill. <laughs> yeah, and even in your smaller estates, I you know people. Um, live very frugally, and maybe once every two years you can you can uh, uh, do that dream trip that you've been right. thinking about, or or right. or, or whatever. I, I think whatever it really it is. helps to see the numbers, and you know we have a whole sheet that lays out all of the assumptions that we use, and it's not just this rate of return, this tax rate. It's you are going to spend, you know, this, you're going to give your kids 10,000 a year. You're going to buy a new car every two years. It's very detailed. And then we say, okay, and you could still spend X. And yeah. I think it's really helpful and comforting to go through that exercise. It, Do I, you I have any more slides, Laura? Um, yes. Hey, planning. Well, you have a, that's a good tee up for the next series, right? Yeah, that's, we're going to talk about that uh, tomorrow. Right, but obviously a very important part of your overall financial planning and your advisors should certainly make sure that you have the basics in place. Um, and one of the things you know, that we do, for example, is we usually will do a write-up of their estate plan in, in plain English in two or three pages to make sure you know, everybody, under so we understand, make sure they understand um, you know, what they have and um, if it's what they want. And, and, and I will say one thing about that, that I just wanna say, Estate planning attorneys are so busy. None of them, none of them are giving good service right now. I mean, everybody is so behind. It's hard to get an appointment. The follow-up is not what it used to be. And I, you know, I'm not maybe making a little bit of excuse for them, but I mean, just, I would say, expect that everybody's really busy. Lots of potential um, 
changes what on the I would say is, is what very few people do, involve your financial advisor with your estate plan. They know about your money. They know more about your family. They can assist you in developing a good estate plan. Run yeah. your estate plan by your financial advisor so that they are become aware of it and they can assist you. It's yeah. a, it's a and, living document. Yeah, and we always re like to review a trust before it's signed. Uh, we ask for the draft of it. A lot of times we'll be doing the meetings together. Um, definitely agree with that. Um, so there's a lot that, there's a lot that uh, you get to talk about in the next series on estate planning for sure. Uh, potential moving or you know planned moving parts. There's this applicable uh, exclusion of the 12 million is set to go away in 2025 if if nothing's done sooner. So a lot to not going to affect very many people, but some it, it will. Yeah. Um, and then you know the 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 sample couple that we've used here, they had charitable um, gift. Uh, intentions. So I think, you know, for them, maybe donating some money from their IRAs for the um, QCDs is a good way to go. Establishing a donor advised fund. You could, you could set one up for $5,000 at, at Schwab, I think Fidelity too. So I'm, I'm sure you'll get into that in the uh, estate planning uh, uh, section, but this is something that basic estate planning documents, you can change. I mean, put something in place and you can always change it later. And please leave something to charity. Um, what, whatever you know. <laughs> values you have. Yeah. It's a great yeah, way to pass that on. Yep. Yep. And um, I kind of have my 10 recommendations here. Only work with fiduciary fee only advisors. Focus on the asset allocation. You know, no stock pickers win over the long term. Don't time the market. It's really hard not to. You feel like you need to do something in this kind of market, but uh, write it out. Uh, invest tax efficiently. Uh, there's a lot of, that you can do with that. In indexing approach to investing, tax location, meaning certain assets may be better in your IRA versus your taxable account, muni bonds, maximizing contributions to retirement plans if you're still working, don't buy annuities, don't borrow money to spend, you know, department store credit cards, not a good thing. College uh, savings, uh, uh, best in a 529 plan have a will or trust and don't worry about the wrong risks. Like just one final thing. There's like a ton of cyber fraud and crazy stuff going on. And we've certainly seen a lot of that, but unless you do something really crazy, like we do know someone who met a guy online during COVID and he talked her into going to Wells Fargo and getting 750,000 in Bitcoin and it's mm. gone. The FBI said, go file a case online. They wouldn't even come out. But um, there, is, uh, there is so much of that going on. Right. But short of that, people, can, you know, you could have identity theft and all that. But people are, you, you, if your money is at a, a brokerage firm or a bank, people can't steal your money. You're really no. protected. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that, don't overly worry about that. As, as yeah. Kind of example. yeah, I had an individual who watches Fox News. Uh, 10 hours a day. And he literally thought that the Mexicans were coming across the border and to his house in Mission Viejo and it was going to steal his furniture. That's, I mean, it's just irrational fear. Yeah. 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 Well, new, news, uh, news can do that to you, Don. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, let's be more positive on that one. Uh, anyway, so I, you know, anyway, okay. A couple uh, of questions. Ahead, that, to, uh, couple uh, Couple couple questions have come up. Yes. Um, okay. So back when we were looking at a moderate growth portfolio, does that include something like an index fund? Yes. So for us, all of those. Why don't you go ahead and share yeah. the screen so we're on the the same page, so to speak? No, I no. meant I meant uh, he meant turn it off. Me. Uh, yeah. Yes. Sure. Yes. Us, uh, not it. Yes. Sure. Yeah, but I mean, um, just to look at that. Um, I uh, all one more of, slide up, one more slide up. What? One more slide up. Well, I was gonna say all of these holdings are indexed except um, the bonds. All oh, of okay. the stock funds okay. are, are indexed funds for us typically. If I'm if I'm heading towards retirement and I'm pathetically behind in saving money, should I invest Don't aggressively? <laughs> Don't retire yet. Should I not always a good thing. Should I invest conservatively or aggressively other than figure out how to get more money, work longer? 
Um, that's a great question. Depends on how old you are, health, life expectancy, what other assets you have. Do you have a home? Is it paid off? Um, are you going to get an inheritance, etc.? Um, but you don't want to get too aggressive, but you may need to be a little more aggressive than some. Yeah. And, and working is not bad. No, I, I was going to I <laughs> have Pete. so many yeah. cases of people who regret retiring or when yeah. they did. Work is not a, it, the, the idea about money is just to create some happiness. You know, a lot, work is not just about earning money. It's about being outside, being around people, having objectives. Yes, Don. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I could mute him just on my own over here. Uh, do you ever work strictly as a straight, um, I want a financial plan? And would you, do you do that with clients or it's not, not in your nature these days? No, no. We don't have the okay. bandwidth to do it's that. Like we, were, we were discussing earlier, there was a, yeah, I won't bother going to a lawyer story. Um, there's a question of, if I have someone who says they're either going to be both or either or neither a non-fiduciary or a fiduciary, can they be both? Is that legal? And I don't think, I think, I think it's probably legal, but it's immoral. Right. That's a great question because <laughs> we've, you know, we've seen people at brokerage firms and banks saying they are fiduciaries when right. they're certainly not by, you know, the way most people would be. Defined. Well, and you said earlier that you were interviewing someone from Merrill Lynch who's a CFP. Well, they're right. a CFP. Obviously, it's the person I want to work with. Right. No, well, it's health how they work as a CFP. Yeah, health, Pre health Prevention Magazine has MDs on the front cover selling stuff. Yeah, annuities, probably. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Oz. <laughs> yeah. No, no, he's running for Senate, so I know well, he can practice medicine at the same time. There's an insurance agent, you know, set, putting out uh, flyers for seminars to sell annuities, and it says it's called like fiduciary financial services or something. I, I don't, then people who don't have a brokerage license but have an insurance license kind of fly under the radar of some of the regulators. And they, okay. they get away with some stuff there. So those are all of our questions. And since I'm a pathetically punctual person, <laughs> I'm going to say thank you very much. Yeah. Laura, thank you very much, Bye. Pete. This is Financial and Estate Literacy. This is um, our final program. It's your money for spring 2022. This is the last week of it. We've enjoyed doing it. We will be back in the fall. Uh, the videos of all of these will be around for uh, at least until the fall. So I thank you all very much for attending and for being here and go Pete. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Laura. Uh, thank you for putting this uh, presentation together. It was excellent. Uh, Don, thank you for the workbook. I recommend everybody to take a look at that workbook. It kind of puts it all together. Uh, all of the videos and the Ask First form for the presenters are gonna be online. Feel free to email is probably the best if you have a question. And if you need a recommendation to an advisor, Laura, myself, there's a lot of other advisors out there that will do the same thing. And her yeah. contact information is on her Ask yeah. First form, which is on the website and available. So we want you to be happy with your money. Be safe. And be safe. Thank yep. you. All Take right. care. Bye-bye.